Out of the 8.30 news on, uh, on Thursdays, we have a segment we like to call What's Up Doc, where we spend some time with the experts at Mercy Health. And this morning is absolutely no exception. Our guest this morning is Dr. James All. We're going to talk about cardiothoracic surgery. Dr. All, good morning to you. Hey, good morning to you guys. How how's, you every, how's everything going with you? Just fine, thank you. Just fine. So you're like the real-life Trapper John then, right? Uh, yeah, I don't have the Winnebago in the parking lot, but uh, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm working on it. I like to have a grill there, you know. That wouldn't be a bad idea at all. It wouldn't be a bad idea, except for, for today, obviously, it would blow off. Yeah, but, that's uh, not, good, not a good grill day. Tell us a little a bit about day. you. Uh, give us some background. Where are you from? I'm originally from Chicago. I was born and raised there and went to college out on the East Coast. Uh, came back to Illinois, went to the University of Chicago, and then trained... Uh, in general surgery, which everyone in cardiac surgery has to do first, uh, at least at that time. I did five years of general surgery training at the Mayo Clinic and then went to Emory University in Atlanta and trained there for four years, including some basic science research and trained in cardiac and thoracic surgery. So, uh, practiced in sunny, beautiful Southern California for about uh, 12 years. I, I can see why to, you'd want to get out of there. Yeah, yeah, you know, terrible. Yeah. <laughs> who, who wants to put up with 75 every no, other day? No. Yeah. And, they, and the other days are 80. I mean, you know. <laughs> right, right. Who wanted to put up with that? Not uh, me. Not me. So anyway, um, came back to the Midwest. I've been here for ooh, a little over 10 years. I was mainly in Wisconsin and I recently moved here to Illinois, and I don't root for the Packers. Want everybody to know that right off the bat. I'm a Bear fan. Nice. Good, Good point. Huh? Good point okay. right there. Yeah, yeah. So uh, then after that, you know, basically I do cardiac surgery, which is bypass surgery and valve replacement. I also do what's called thoracic surgery, which is lung surgery, thymus surgery. Occasionally, I don't, I don't do a lot of primary, what we call esophageal surgery. Occasionally, I help out if someone has a perforation. And uh, I also do sort of a little touch of vascular surgery, which is the carotid artery, which is in your neck, gives blood flow to your brain. And uh, those are the three main areas I work in. Did, did you always know that surgery was going to be uh, where oh, you yeah. ended up in? Yeah, yeah. I always, I always liked anatomy. I like the mechanistic attitude about surgery. You know, there's a problem. We can sort of fix it, you know. So I, I've, I've always been focused on cardiac surgery ever since maybe mid, mid portion of college, maybe. Yeah. So did you did you always know that medicine was where you were going to go when you're when you're knocking around in high school? Everybody else trying to figure uh, out, you know, if they were going to be a, an astronaut, a, a rock and roll star, a movie star, or uh, you were over there with the one going, no, well, I'm going to have well, a stethoscope. I, I could say rock and roll would be first, and, you know, and, and a fighter pilot would be second, and maybe a heart surgeon third. No, I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> no, I was, you know, I was, I was you know, fortunate. I had, I had parents that really emphasized education. Uh, my father was a, a Ph.D. at the University of Illinois. My mother was a high school teacher and a guidance counselor in Chicago. And they always emphasized to, to educate and, and to look at all possibilities. And when I got to college, I was like, okay, this is what I want to do. And I like taking care of people, and I also like science. So that was how I went into it. And how, how long have you had the, the, the full title that we read this morning? Ooh, the full title. Well, I graduated from medical school in uh, no, it was 86, so okay. 14 years. and 12. So, yeah, we're talking about 36 years. I've been, I've been MD, yeah. Outstanding. That, that really is outstanding. Now, for, for people who are, you, you, you described it a little bit, but cardiothoracic surgery, you, you know, uh, it, it, first off, I, I think like many medical disciplines, when you look at what was going on 30 years ago in your field, as opposed to how you approach it today, it, it, it's got to be mind-blowing. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a, a different field. Some of the surgeries we do are similar to what was done, but we do it in a more streamlined fashion. Uh, you know, people have been doing it, you know, they've done thousands, if not millions, of, of bypass surgeries. So we're we're very familiar with what to do and how to do it a little faster, get people out of the hospital, use less blood. Uh, we're very, very conscious of uh, complication rate and mortality rate. So, so you know, we, we, we've streamlined that. I think the management of... when. 
when I do lung surgery, is a lot of cancer surgery. And so I think chemotherapy diagnosis has markedly advanced in uh, oncology and, and cancer. You, you, you said a couple times you're, you're, you're very interested in science, so I'm, I'm sure the, the next big thing is always, uh, is always interest you. What, what's, what's next for you guys? You, you, you talked about some of the stuff that, you know, we've been doing for a while, just maybe in different ways. Is there, is there something on the horizon that's going to change fundamentally uh, the way you do some procedures? Um, that's a very good question. I think that um, my cardiology counterpoints uh, are, 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 or my, my, my cardiology colleagues will probably be doing some things through the artery and the vein that won't require major incisions or anesthesia. I think from a surgical standpoint, we are doing some surgeries, surgeries in a, we call it minimally invasive, I say less invasive because you still have to be put to sleep and have some surgery and, and it has some risks associated with it. So I, I think there's some changes coming on, yeah. Are we doing more or less uh, heart surgeries these days? I would say probably slightly less heart surgeries. I think a lot of heart surgeries, um, they've been supplanted by some stenting and by some medical therapy, but still we do heart surgeries and we do some difficult ones. Obviously, transplant hasn't changed. That's still need transplantation. I think also with the COVID, we had to put people on an extra corporeal membrane oxygenator, basically something that serves the function of your lungs and, to a certain extent, your heart. And so that was something not relatively new, but really in vogue in the last year or two, and cardiac surgeons have been very involved in that. You know, uh, Mercy Health's got a little bit of a, a bio up uh, on the website talking about you, and one of the things that jumped out at me that uh, I, I really liked uh, seeing is um, you... Um, you you make these uh, you you discuss medical, surgical, and personal issues that a patient's dealing with at the time uh, of a consultation. Uh, when when you work with your patients, you discuss the surgery and the post op care, but you put an emphasis on how this impacts their family. Tell yeah, me a little I, bit more about that approach. Well, you know, you know, you have someone who's you know somebody. You know, I'm not operating. I may be operating on a patient, but that's someone's father, mother, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, nephew, or niece and uh, son, daughter, what, whatever. And so you have to, the family's going to be concerned. They, you know, to me, it might be routine. And I don't think anything's routine unless, you know, you're in the backseat of the car waving goodbye after four or five days. And thanks a lot, Doc. Right. But it, for me, it's routine. For them, they don't know. Uh, they get upset. They cry. They want to know, is he going to be like him or herself? After the procedure, will they be able to go back to work? They're worried about issues of, say, stroke and infection. So they're, they're concerned about all these complications, as are we, obviously. But we sometimes don't verbalize it as much. And, you know, my father, um, he had been a smoker for a period of time, and he underwent bypass surgery. And I remember crying in the waiting room for him. Mm -hmm. You know, so I know what it feels like to, to, to have that discomfort and 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 not knowing what might happen. So I remember uh, my dad saying to me after bypass surgery that he was relieved because now there's country clubs he can get into that he couldn't get into before. <laughs> the zipper club. Yep, right. that was it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were no, clubs. No, that, I, unless you've had three or four of them, it's just you're not you're not the kind of person we're looking for. Oh yeah, yeah. But you know the the real thing I can really emphasize to people is how they live their life. They gotta have to get more sleep. They have to stop smoking. They have to uh, exercise, have to eat better. I mean, all these things that are part of lifestyles have to be changed drastically for people not to have these serious uh, cardiovascular problems. And I'm sure any doctor would agree with me in that regard. Um, you know, in my uh, very ignorant view of what, how how hospitals work and in, in doctors' lives. And, okay, know, this should be good. I'm, I'm waiting for this. Uh, <laughs> I, I've always kind of thought of, you know, the heart surgeon, you know, kind of, kind of be like the, I don't know, the uh, the closer in baseball. You just kind of come in and uh, and, and you clean up what's been uh, what's been here before, and I, I'm here to save things, and and uh, and, and I'm done, and I, I saw you up, and, and I'm out the door, I grab my golf clubs, and I'm, I'm out golfing. I never really, uh, you, you just talked about your, your talk with, uh, with family members. 
When do you become part of the uh, of the the bedside the bedside medical uh, help uh, when you're talking to uh, 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 patients and families? When, right. When does that process begin with you? Yeah, yeah, I, I, that's a good question. First of all, I'm often a referred patients, so primary care doctors send patients to cardiologists. Cardiologists do the diagnostic work of angiograms, CT scans. Uh, echocardiograms, and then they refer the patient to me. They may call me beforehand and say, oh, this is this uh, woman, she has this, this, and that. When I see a patient, I go in, I sit down, and I say, I'm going to do your surgery, and this is why we're doing it, and this is what we're going to do, and this is the goal of the surgery. And then I talk about risk and complications. That's when I become part of the team. And I tell them, your questions, whatever they are, you can always ask me, and family members can always ask me. Then, just before the surgery, they wheel into the preoperative holding area, and I talk with them again. And you'll ask me questions. Uh, with this COVID thing, you know, it's limited to certain people. They can't be in the, you know, in the hospital room afterwards. So there's a lot of, there's, there are impediments to communication because of that, but nevertheless, you have to talk to everyone. I go in the room. I have a great crew that, you know, anesthesia will get the patient to sleep, but I'm usually sitting in the background just in case because sometimes, you know, cardiac disease can, can become unstable, especially coronary disease during the induction or being placing someone to sleep. Then I go in. I make a skin incision. I do all the surgery. I close the bone. I have a, an excellent assistant who also has some plastic surgery skills. She's a nurse practitioner. She will then sort of close the skin. The patient goes to the ICU, and then I go to the ICU, and I sit outside the room and do paperwork and dictation, but I'm there, and I get every call about that patient usually until they go home. Dr. Hall, you seem like exactly the doctor that many people who are listening right now go, that, that's the guy I want. That, that, yeah. That's him. I think I figured out exactly who I want. Now, <laughs> well, there are a lot of doctors like me. There are a lot of, a lot of uh, guys and, and women in the field now who are very uh, assiduous. They're, they're, they're very, very focused. And, and you know, it, it's a contact sport. You're not like, uh, the closer, uh, yeah, you may close, but... If you touch them, you're responsible for them. That's right. right. Well, 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 we'll have some of the other ones on, and if they can throw out words like assiduous, we right. might consider them as possible <laughs> candidates. But That's on. an SAT word, right? For <laughs> yeah. a 17-year-old. Right. But unless they use that word, you're still our guy. Uh, okay. for, for people who are interested in getting themselves a heart checkup, they want, they want to look into this part of their lives, what do you recommend they do from here? Well, you know, they'll see their primary physician. He'll look at their height and weight and blood pressure. That's the first place to start. Then they'll look at whether they have, what's their blood sugar, what's their cholesterol, what's their lipid levels. That, that's some basic family practice, general internal medicine. What's your lifestyle? Do you smoke? Do you have lung disease? All these things can be attacked right at the base level of, 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 a, of, a, of a general practitioner, a general internist. Uh, examination and follow-up. When you think there's an issue, when you think there may be coronary disease or an irregular heartbeat or heart failure or a valve problem or maybe uh, a lung cancer, then you transition to a specialist. Cardiology for the heart, a pulmonologist uh, uh, for the lung. Sometimes, you know, we can get CT scans without conferring with the pulmonologist, but, they, but they're the experts on the uh, the function of, of of lungs and whether people then can tolerate it. and they also have a medical oncologist who then gets involved if they're so so there's there's a before you get to the specialist you can look at some of your own issues and concerns and you know I'll be frank you know the general interns work hard and they don't sometimes have time to spend thirty minutes with everybody counseling them they do but then people walk out the office and 
go eat a hamburger and fries. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sounds now, good that, right now, doesn't it? You know, you know uh, that that chat's over a bacon cheeseburger and go down real well here. Yeah, that's yeah, probably yeah, yeah. Well, well, yeah. I'll see you later, guys. You know? <laughs> yeah. No, you you don't want to hear that from a guy like you unless it's no, a complete you, social. You, you want to get to know me, but not too well. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, we've enjoyed what we've gotten to know this morning, Doctor All. We appreciate you taking time out of we know is a very very busy schedule and uh, taking some time to enlighten us this morning. All right. Hey, it's been my pleasure. Call me t call me back anytime, guys. We would love yeah. to. Thank you very much. That's All Dr. Right, James Hall morning. with Mercy Health.